This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. My guest today is my friend, Mark Graney. Mark is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Gray Man series. He also wrote seven books with Tom Clancy, three while Tom was alive and four after that. And he also has a standalone book called Red Metal. His latest book, Relentless, is on shelves now. And his next one, called Sierra 6, which is part of the Gray Man series, comes out February 15th. He also has a movie coming out with Netflix, and that's based on the first novel, The Gray Man, and it's starring Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans, and that is coming sometime in 2022. We recorded this at BoucherCon, which is an author's conference back in November of 2019. And uh, now I am super excited to finally get this out there because Mark is one of my favorite people. Awesome guy, incredible author. If you haven't checked out the Gray Man series, I would start at the beginning and go all the way through. Amazing. And Mark is also an incredible human being. And I am honored and proud to call him a friend. You can find him at Mark Graney, that's G-R-E-A-N-E-Y, books.com. And you can link to his social channels from there. So now, without further ado, Mark Graney. Welcome, everyone. I am here with, well, first, let's, let's put something to rest. Greeny or grainy? It's grainy, but I, I usually that. don't correct people. I know. Uh, I saw I, you last I, night. I looked when we were doing our other <laughs> podcast, and they said greeny, and I looked Did at they? you, and you, you hide it very well, but <laughs> I know, so I know the tells. It. Yeah, it's, uh, we say, my family says grainy. Other people with the same spelling say greeny, so right. who cares? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 it, when you look at the book, mm-hmm. one would think grainy. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. So okay. we were here at BoucherCon. 2019. Yeah. And it's my second one and it is your number 10. 10. I just realized that today. This Amazing. is number 10. Yeah. I started that, in San Francisco in 2010. That is incredible. And so at two, 2010, uh, what did you have out? I just, I just had the gray man out and my second book on target was coming out in a few weeks or something like that. Okay. Um, so you hadn't yet done a Clancy. No, no, that wasn't until late 2011 when that one came out. Okay. So that was 2011. And yeah. so, uh, for the listeners, we, uh, you did seven, novels with Tom Clancy, three when he was alive. Correct. And then the rest at, for the estate after he passed away. That's exactly right. And that's a lot of work. It was a lot of work. That was in six years. And I was also doing my other series for most of those years. Uh, 2014, he died in late 13. And the family asked me to continue his series. And then they wanted two books in 14. Um, I mean, there was already idea of, about doing yeah. a summer book with someone else writing it. But I wanted to be the first person to write one after Tom passed because I did three with him there at right. the end. And um, so I did two in 2014. But other than, other than that year, I, I wrote a Gray Man book and a Clancy book for, uh, for six years. That's incredible because a Clancy novel is about four novels in one. They're humongous. Yes. Uh, it actually said in my contract they needed to be at least 150,000. I never turned one in less than like 165, but right. most of them were like 190. Right. Uh, and that was what his were too after Hunt for October, I guess. Let's say what was... Um, Red Storm Rising. Yeah, that's that, a pretty thick one. Yeah, he got more and more. Like if you look at Bear and the Dragon, um, it's about a thousand page or nine hundred pages and very small okay. <laughs> typeface. So I don't know how many words it is, but it's it's definitely more than anything <laughs> I did. It's up there. Yeah, it's up there. And we got introduced uh, before my first novel came out through James Yeager, Tactical right. Response, yeah, yeah. and he connected us on email, and you got uh, right back to me and. Uh, you know, you're one of the first people that I that I met in the industry. Oh, that's um, great! And uh, you know, you were obviously so welcoming and kind to me, and I I'll never forget it. So yeah, I, I've been it. hearing about your book for a, a long time, and it still wasn't coming out for several months. But people have been talking about uh, Terminalist for quite a while, and so James, who I've been friends with since 2005 or something like that, going to his um, his his firearm school in Middle Tennessee. Uh, you know, he reached out to me and said that he knew you, and I was like, yeah, I know all about this guy. So so it was pretty easy fit. Awesome. And you, uh, and you found him, did you just want to do some training for one of the novels and, and kind of get into that world a little bit and do a, do a Google search or was it word of mouth or was it just personal before the novels? It was, it started out as a Google search because I wanted, um, I was writing, but I didn't have anything published and I just wanted to sort of like, you know, up my skills a little bit. I owned a handgun at that point, but, 
I started watch, looking at his videos and stuff, you know, sitting in my office cubicle in yeah. 2004 or something like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to get out there with a carbine and, <laughs> and, and, and all that. And, uh, and so I did it. And if, I remember the first time I was out there, he was talking about different types of shooting or whatever. And I was just like, I just want to let you know, I've never, <laughs> I've fired my AR, but I've never fired it rapidly. Right. Nice. <laughs> He's and like, he, oh boy. And he said, that will change today. And awesome. it, did, it has changed ever since. So cool. And that's close to you, right? You can just drive it's out two there. two hours. Yeah, nice. it's not bad at all. That's awesome. And so you incorporated a lot of that stuff into the books. I noticed you thank, thank them, thank sure. James, thank Tactical Response at the, yeah. uh, in the beginning of the novel. Yeah, the, the, the people that you meet out there is, is more important than the, the gear and the guns and uh, it, the mindset and the actual people you meet out there. I've met people that were like uh, UAV pilots out at Creech and I've met um, you know, federal uh, like SWAT, yeah. I've met um, special forces, all, all that sort of stuff. And you stay in the team room there right. with the guys. And um, it's, it's a, it was a great experience for somebody like me who did not serve to uh, meet and spend a lot of time with, with these people and kind of add to the uh, legitimacy of your Yeah, writing. no, totally. Have you done anything else? Did you ever do a, like a driving course or any of those types of things? Yeah, I did a stunt driving course. Nice. Um, Where so did you that? Not, it was down in Atlanta at Bobby Orr Motorsports nice. and uh, a little north of Atlanta. And um, so you did all the J turns and the, you know, one, you know, all these different things. So and, much fun. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I realized I was not adept at it because my, my body and my feet and everything want to do certain things when sure. you're sliding, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's usually the opposite of what you have to do if you're going to you yeah. know, do this right. So, um, I learned a ton and incorporated that. In my work. Yeah. There's uh some of the most fun things that I ever did in the SEAL teams were doing those driving courses uh -huh. at night around these courses, derelict vehicles, nods on trying to spin each oh other out. Gosh. They do like an Indian run uh -huh. where you're like, I can, for those of you that are runners, uh, at least back in the day, you used to weave your way through a run, sprint to the front of the line. And then the next person would uh -huh. go, uh -huh. we do that with cars wow. weaving through at night on nods. But as you'd go through, like, yeah, as you get their surefire lights out and try to blind you as you're going by oh or try gosh. to try to pit you uh, off this and spin you out. Yeah. So such a blast. I had oh, a great yeah, time. Yeah. So we learned, you know, like we talked about, you know, like pit maneuver, and then the counter pit maneuver and they were explaining there's a counter counter pit maneuver and i was like so awesome your brain has to be working pretty quickly to make all that yeah come, come well, i think through. that helps because when you're writing you know if you don't do that then what you're relying on is like you know the dukes of hazard back movies. in the 80s movies. or movies exactly yeah, yeah. And, and uh and it might so it, it just adds that credibility adds yeah. that authenticity and might be totally different than somebody else that's writing just kind of making it up based on some of the tv shows and movies that they've watched yeah you, you know I, I i've owned firearms for a long time and i do a lot of shooting and so you see things in books or, or in films and um and it's just like gobbledygook to you if you know stuff and obviously as a writer you you have to act like you know a lot more than you actually act. You know, a lot of times right. my, the depth of my knowledge is all on the page. You yeah. know, people assume that you have more experience than you do, but yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. You have to yeah. get enough to, to get on the page. It's your job. But yeah. Um, yeah so like you, you want to get things as, as correct as possible. Well, there's another, I think I did three of those courses and I did not do um, O'Neill racing out of, I think they're in New Hampshire, but uh, that's the one I want to go to. The guys all talk about that one. It's a rally racing course, but they have a security one that has a security focus to it. Yeah. So you're using rally racing cars and you're doing it in mud and gravel and oh, wow. asphalt, whatever, and yeah. all these different really mediums. practical. Yeah. yeah. So I want to do that. I actually want to take my daughter there when she learns how to drive. Oh, yeah. I remember when I started driving, I wanted to do all those things. And maybe uh, not oh, right when gosh. she learns how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give her a month. Give her a month. Yeah. yeah. Maybe <laughs> two. But uh, I definitely want to, well, Let's be honest. It's also an excuse for me to go there. Absolutely. Uh, and tell my wife, hey, I'm going to take our daughter so she can learn how <laughs> to do these go. things. It's important for <laughs> self-reliance. She's good cover. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. So I will, uh, I will get out there and do that. Yeah. And, and your books, I, you know, it's so refreshing to read a book where there's not mistakes as far as that sort of stuff goes. And, uh, you know, some great authors out there that I love sometimes have these egregious yeah. mistakes and yeah. I don't let it bother me. You know, right. you still like, like the, you I want to like enjoy the book. it. You exactly. Just, right. Exactly. But you're like, oh man, I wish that yeah. he'd gotten that right. Yeah. Uh, Cause it would just change one word. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah, you get it, you get it right. Thank, uh, you know, you I, every single time. Yeah. And, thanks uh, and it's thanks noticeable. so much. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, something that I'm into and have firsthand knowledge of. There's other things like in my, book that comes out next february there's a lot of boating in it and i've been on boats but i don't know all the nomenclature and all that sort of stuff so i reached out to our friend simon gervais who, nice. who, who is a boat owner yeah. I've been on his boat. he's there right now he's and, actually yeah, in the he right the now. yeah and, and i was i was like hey i was gonna say if you look over the left side yeah, i was gonna use this term <laughs> port it, side yeah i was like this doesn't sound right and uh 
and, and he's like, no, that's not right. He's like, this that's is hilarious. what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did the same thing. I didn't know. People th- assume just because you're in the Navy, you know about boats, uh, yeah. but I made it through 20 years with uh, barely ever seeing one. Wow. And uh, so in the second novel, main character, James Reese goes across the Atlantic, but I had to reach out to people yeah. that had done some long yeah. distance sailing, racing. Oh, it sounded like something them. you were really into. Like, yeah, hey, that's great. That's I have no true. idea. You did a good job but, with uh, it. Well, the people I talked to were pretty serious, yeah. uh, serious people. And yeah. they, uh, they looked at it for me and gave me some, a lot of advice. And yeah. same thing with third one that comes out here it's supposed to be in april but uh gulfstream i have a g550 in there and i sent it to the people at gulfstream yes. and uh, they looked through it went through it and changed some stuff that i you know i thought just looking at the website wow. was uh very very obvious but to me just looking at pictures right but they they tuned me up on all That's that so. uh, just coincidentally for me my next door neighbor is a um is a corporate pilot jet pilot nice. and she has a falcon 50 and um and so i i started like asking her things and it's funny there's there's things in my earlier books and things in my later books both about planes that are right. totally <laughs> different because i, I learned what i didn't know earlier on i totally get it do you, yeah. ever, do you ever want to do because you, so you dive you scuba dive now and you yeah. go on trips uh, it seems like every year now you have one on the books almost. yeah i've got i'll be in hawaii next week diving and i'm going to the bahamas at right when at the new year you do that any uh any plans to ever learn how to fly I would like to. I just flew, flew in a flight simulator yesterday here that. in Memphis, in yeah. Southwest. Um, Ward Larson yeah. and, uh, took me over there. He's a Southwest pilot and a thriller author. And um, and it was pretty fantastic. Pretty I mean, cool. It, yeah, it, your yeah, pictures are sweet. Very legitimate. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to learn to fly. It's just something that, you know, when I had the time, I didn't have the money. Right. And now when I have maybe the money for it, it's yeah. just like harder to find the time. time. So yep. that's just how life goes, I guess. Right. I think David Morell did it for one of his books. He learned how to fly. And back when authors really weren't doing that sort of thing, he went to, I think he went to Bondron, but he went to a, a driving school to uh-huh. do the tactical stuff oh, wow. also and, Perfect. and wove that into novels and Perfect. got to talk about it a little bit in yeah. interviews. Yeah. And he's, sort of he's thing. another author who, who you, you can see it on the page that he's learning what he's talking about. You yeah. Can, I, I realized very early, like if you read David Morrell, you could tell he's just so fascinated about the thing he's talking about. It, and it really sucks you into the story. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh my gosh, he's he's enjoying this process yeah. as, as much as I'm enjoying reading it. Yeah, he goes all in on that stuff. And he's one of the guys that I read growing up and um, you know, he wrote obviously First Blood in 1972, so before I was born. Right. But uh, in the 80s, that series of novels he did, starting with um, uh, the, Brotherhood the Brotherhood of the Rose, of the Rose. and then Fraternity of the Stone, League of Night and Fog. I mean, that was right at a very formidable uh, formative time for me yeah and of course the protagonists and those stories all backgrounds that i wanted to have in real life one day right, and right. so i would just wait for that next david morrell novel to come out wait for that next nelson demille novel to come out wait for that next jc pollock or aj quinnell or mark olden these guys that had these protagonists with backgrounds that i wanted one day um and then looking back on it that gave me a good foundation for this in the they were my professors in the art of storytelling right like right. that that and it, the magic from the 80s like Last of the Breed, reading that one summer, oh, like 1987 one. No, from, uh, from Louis L'Amour. It's, okay. like, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so capturing that magic is something I'm trying to do in my my novels because I have such a good, great memories of reading those books growing up. And uh, did you read those kinds growing up? or what did I you... read, I, so I was big, I was really into Clancy, Frederick Forsyth, Nelson DeMille, um, Ralph Peters, uh, gosh, there's a guy named Gerald Seymour who's a, who's a, a British author who I really like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's so many good Lynn Deaton um a bunch of good it was mostly like spy stuff or military I read a lot of military nonfiction, second world war uh non-fiction civil war non-fiction, fiction. and you read that did you start reading that early on or did you find that at some point during your your youth I started uh I started with the nonfiction first my dad was a combat veteran of the second world war and so you know we had the guns around the house and he has a he has a 1915 Erfurt Luger uh, wow. that he got off a Nazi and and uh, wow. I still have it and uh, his uniforms and stuff like that so when wow. I was a little kid that was fascinating to me and I, oh, yeah. I really got into reading about the Second World War I live in the South I live in Memphis so the Civil War is you know talked about and battlefields are just a couple hours from my house and um, so that's what I was into first and I I never read a thriller until I picked up um, Patriot Games, no kidding. Uh, which was Tom Clancy. Yeah. And, um, and I picked that book up because everybody had been talking about Clancy for two or three years right. at that point. And, uh, I was very interested in the IRA. I was doing, I was a political science major. I just started college okay. and, um, I was like, okay, this is about IRA. It might be interesting, although it's just a dumb novel, you know? And then I realized you could learn so much from these books and have a great time doing it. Exactly. You know? And that, that's what really sucked me into just reading everybody and everything in, in that genre. 
Yeah, no, I found myself reading those novels growing up and then going to the nonfiction, like, oh, what is yeah. he talking about yeah. here? Oh, wow, I'm going to do a little more research yeah. into that. Yeah. Even if it's just a word or a, an element within the federal government, within the CIA, like, oh, what is yeah, that? Is exactly. that? Is that real? And yeah. then going to do the research on it at the local library before the internet. Right. You know, so those guys definitely helped in my path, both to confirm that I wanted to, to serve in special operations and to, to be it's a thriller. A yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. And so you've been doing this a long time. So I'm going to take this an opportunity as an opportunity to pick your brain sure. a little bit okay. on process. Uh, how's it evolved over the years and how do you go about doing this? Do you start, if you're doing one book a year, which you're going to start doing? I hope so. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think <laughs> so. so yeah. Do you have a plan to start on a date, to finish on a date? Do you stick to that schedule? Um, and uh, when, what does that process look like? Yeah, you? people might be surprised that I, I feel like I want to change, you know, I I want to learn a lot more. I just bought a bunch of books on, um, outlining novels and stuff like that. And, you know, literally like outlining for dummies and and things (laughs) like that. I'm like, I might be a dummy when it comes to outlining because, uh, I started out as, as, as something of a plotter and then, you know, filling in the blanks or whatever. And then it's gotten a little more as a pantser, you know, a little bit more where I'm just, you know, like, Oh, I'll get that on the, I'll figure that out on the day. And then, um, and then, you just end up in the editing process going, okay, this character is introduced too early or too late, right. or this, you know, this moment happens not in the ex- exact part. And I, I think that if I structure before I write the first word a little bit more, yeah. then that's probably going to serve me, um, especially mentally. Yeah. Um, how it's changed is in the old days, I would, I wrote my first novel, The Gray Man, when I had a full-time job and I wrote it from 5 30 in the morning to 7 a.m before work and then you know several hours on on saturdays or whatever and it, i did it in six months wow then i became a full-time author and i did my next book like in nine months and i, I had all day to do it right. like I, you, I got a little bit slower and yeah, less yeah. disciplined and um and then as i did the clancy books and the gray man books i just had to crank out words so all day every day i, I was working wow and um and then it's just as you get older it gets a little harder to focus not not because your age but because created so many things right. already. So I'll start to write something and I'll be like, God, this feels like something else I did or, or whatever. And it makes me kind of back out of it and try something else. So I do think I need to be a little more methodical, um, you know, in, in the planning stages yeah. uh, for, for subsequent books. But um, so far, I don't think it comes out on the page as a problem. It's just, yeah. I just think mentally I would right. keep things in order in my head a little bit better. Right. Do you do it in Word or Scrivener or what do you use? I, I do it in Word. I'd love to use Scrivener. I, tr- I started once with Scrivener and it, it was a little complicated and I just didn't have that much time to figure it out. Right. I was like, you got to watch the videos. You, you got to watch the, yeah, spend like I've, the two hours watching those videos. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm watching the videos and I have a book on Scrivener nice. next to my bed and, um, and so I am going to try and sort of outline it. So you, you do Scrivener, I yeah, guess. Yeah, this is my first one that I did. In, the other ones were Word. Uh-huh. And yeah. the first one was fairly linear. But the second novel jumped around quite a bit. So doing that in Word and copying and pasting yeah. and then uh, just being worried that if I'm going to cut and paste, I'm going to lose it. Or so I'm going to uh, copy, then paste, then go right. back and delete. Like, and then you can't find, oh, you know, like yeah. if you're all in one big document. I, and I run into that in my last book. And I'd run into that and be like, oh, I remember we talked about this and I can't find it. Can't and you find, find out it. you've repeated it. And then right. you, you can clean that up in the editing. But it'd be nice to <laughs> hit it the first exactly. time. Exactly. I think it's made things more efficient. So this is the first one that I've done all in Scrivener, Good. the third one. And it was very helpful being able to pull that research in yeah. to files, bring those websites yeah. instead of having to think, oh, geez, where did I find that? Is it still in my history on the website? Did I save it in favorites? <laughs> was it on my phone? Where, where was it? Was it right. in a book? Oh, I can't remember. Right. But to be able to pull all those in there and have yeah. those notes attached to the chapters that uh, that you're working on where they pertain yeah. has been just a lifesaver. And yeah, then being I'm, able to see it like a chalkboard type thing or like right. a... Like a uh, uh, yeah, corkboard. Corkboard, yeah. yeah. And move them around, drag and drop. Yeah. Game changer. But then editor wants it in Word, but then you could easily export to Word yeah. and send it off. And so once I did that, then I just stayed with Word. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it's so a, after the first solid. draft, you, you just yeah, after I get it to, yeah, that makes sense to New York and they, yeah. they look at it in Word, then I just stay, stay right. in that. And so how did you break out? Did you do the traditional sending out query letter type things and, and do all that? Or how did you, I, I did, I sent out some query letters for, uh, I, I, I think Gray Man was the fourth novel that I completed, third novel that I completed. So where are those other ones? Uh, they're still out there in the, you know, they're, I, they're not out anywhere. They're in, a, they're, they're on, on a hard shelf. Drive? Yeah. They're on a shelf. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, uh, at at my house, um, I spent a good amount of, I I basically wrote until I finished a book and then I was like, Hey, the internet's been invented. I should look and see how one gets an agent. (laughs) And the first thing I read was like, you know, you don't want your book to be too long. And my first book was like 150,000 words. 
too many characters. And, yeah. and so I, I saw a lot wrong with it. So my first book, I never sent it out to anybody. Um, I wrote, an, I was working on another one and I sent out query letters um, and, you know, sent them out as if it was finished. <laughs> okay. Got it. Um, nice. And, uh, you know, cause I had, I had a, a lot of it and I didn't really get any traction at all, but I decided that, um, you know, I just decided I'd look and see who like one of my favorite authors was and see who his agent was. And, uh. Um, this guy, Ralph Peters, who is a fantastic author and not as famous as maybe he should be. Um, I saw his, his agent was named Scott Miller. And, and then I looked up Scott Miller and, and saw that he was going to be at a uh, conference in, in uh, San Diego, like two months from then. And it, you could send in like 20 pages and pick two agents there okay. to read your stuff. I had a lot of social anxiety back then. And <laughs> I didn't even leave my hotel room to go see the first agent. Really? Like I, yeah, I had an appointment and everything. Really? And, you know, who I knows? I would never Maybe, have guessed that. Yeah, no, I was totally just just pacing the room. I was like, I, I can't, you know, I was just self-conscious about the writing and everything. And so then I went and saw Scott and made myself, and it was a great experience. And we started a relationship. He didn't represent that book. You know, he said it was probably, it was not a good start for me. It was really good writing, but he didn't think the story was that marketable for somebody that they didn't know who it was. Okay. And so I wrote a whole other book for him, and he came back to me and said, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, I don't think this is, should be your first book. He's, but it had the gray man in it. Okay. Like if this, if it was just about this guy and the people who were after him and, came up with that kind of a story. So I wrote a whole nother book for him and that's how I got in. So I, I'd sent it out. Maybe I'd sent my work out to a dozen agents and got nothing. And then I went to a conference and the first agent I met at a conference was my agent to this day. So Kidding. I do think getting that FaceTime in front of them is helpful. It also helps yeah. you with your pitch sure. and, and all these other things. So I do think there's a definite benefit. Got it. And then so the so the fourth one then was he said, Hey, try it one more time. Maybe use this character. Yeah. And uh maybe gave a couple other pieces of advice and then you did Gray Man and he said, This is the one. Yeah, it's funny. I I he's you know, I told him I was gonna write a whole nother book, um, because that's what he wanted me to do. And I said, Can I give it to you at fifty pages? Just so, so I don't so go. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he said, Sure. So I did. And you know, it takes him he's got a bunch of like real clients. And uh, <laughs> so it took him a while to get to it, but I kept working on it. But um, yeah, he came back after the first 50 pages and he said, I really like it, except this beginning scene where he does this kind of retribution thing. Um, he needs to actually rescue one of the guys instead of all okay. the, yeah. So, um, so I remember thinking like, well, that's really over the top. And, but I went and did it and that's affected the entire series. The series pushes the envelope for credulity as much as, yeah. you know, like maybe more than I would have if, if I just hadn't pushed that. So then I spent a lot of time trying to get realism in there as yeah. well to, to cover for it so um, i think it changed it improved the whole series when he did that and was he when when you when he read that one those first 50 pages mm -hmm. uh and told you give you that advice was he like this is it you are on the track let's no. do this <laughs> really oh <laughs> no. man i finished the whole book and he, and he read it and he, he called me up and he's like yeah i think this is pretty good i'd be happy really? to he's like i think i might get this public you know be able to get this published and i'll uh you know all that sort of stuff and of course i was in heaven um, but it wasn't like, oh my God, this thing's going to auction on Monday. <laughs> you know? right. um, yeah. So he sent it out to 10 publishers and nine publishers turned it down. Really? And the 10th publisher, Tom Colgan. Was, no kidding. He's the guy who picked it up and he's still my, he's still my editor. Yeah. And uh, you know, I did the Tom Clancy books with him. And, um, Amazing. Yeah, he's my guy. and how much did that change once he got it? Um, the first gray man. The first one didn't change very much. There were, there were aspects of it. He, I remember he wanted some of the, not violence toned down, but some of the, the believability in, about the wounds the character receives, you know, made it a little bit more believable. I love that part because some of the movies that I think about from the 80s, like the characters got pretty beat up. You yeah. think of uh, Indiana Jones, he's getting beat up throughout that yeah. the whole thing. You're right, thinking right. Rambo's getting beat up. You know, you're thinking Martin Riggs and Lethal Weapon getting oh my tortured. Gosh. In the thing. Yeah, like, yeah. All these, so I love it when the, when the guys get, you know, so yeah. I, I thought about that when I was reading the first grade. Yeah, movie. and I think it shows some vulnerability in the character and, and I think it, the reader is really tied to a story where the people they care about really get hurt. Yeah. Just really get messed up. And because it's a first one, they don't know if he's going to make it or not. Exactly. You know, maybe exactly. on book, you know, eight, maybe they think, well, maybe he'll, maybe he's yeah. going to survive. Yeah. But that first one, you don't know if you're, yeah, there was a screenplay written for gray man. And there's been like five written so far, but different <laughs> studios. But uh, I think the first screenplay that th at the end of it, he flatlines and you don't know if he lives or dies. That's awesome. Uh, never got made. And I do think that Hollywood would be like, wait, we want people to know it's going to be a series. You know, yeah. we don't, we, you don't want that to happen to a hero, but it right. read fantastic. Oh, that's so yeah. awesome. Yeah. So the first blood uh, screenplay was more, I guess the ending was more in line with the, with the novel mm -hmm. in that uh, John Rambo dies at the yeah, end. Yeah, he does. Um, and uh, they, but when you watch that, 
if you, there's a, a director's outtake or whatever the extra on it, so you can see that original ending. Oh. and the audience. Oh, they filmed it. Yeah, they filmed oh. it. They filmed that ending first. I never. And then they put it out in the theaters. Right yeah, and then they put it out in the theaters um, for test run. Yeah, and audiences were like, they did not like John Rambo dying right. at the end. Of course, and he. I don't want to, well, spoil it. It's been out since 1972. <laughs> yeah, I, so think you're okay. I think I'm okay here. So he dies in the novel. Yeah. Um, and so that's, so they had to go refilm wow. and have him, have him live. And then I, audiences loved that. He and lived. I think the franchise loved it too. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. That worked out well yeah. for, for quite a few, yeah. quite a few people. But, uh, but it's interesting that, uh, that it, that they had that other ending. Right. And uh, that people, yeah, I never knew they respond. filmed it. Yeah. I, knew, I knew he died in the book. Yeah. Course, and so. you know what? It's, it's, there's a reason they took that out of there. It's, when he kills himself, it's not that good. Oh, really? No. It's not even done that well. Yeah, no. and I find that more often than not when I watch the extras and the uh, the the endings. Yeah, um, like the editors are there for a reason, and usually they get yeah. it right for yeah. on the first on the first take. Right, the artist in you is able to see like, okay, that doesn't play as well as this does. Yeah, you know, impact exactly. Well. The only one that's uh, that's different than that, I'll say, is um, Man on Fire, the yeah. second one with yeah. Denzel Washington. They yeah, did yeah. It in the '80s also, but yeah. the one with Denzel Washington. Right. When you watch the ending that they didn't use, so much better. You're kidding. So I much have to better. see that because The yep. Man on Fire is one of my favorite films. Yeah, I didn't know well, watch, just, watch the other ending. Can you say if he survives? Or I'm not going to say a thing because you haven't seen it yet. I'm going to watch it. But, uh, but the way, and I, you know, I watched it the first time, I saw how what happens at the end and I was like, oh, okay, well, I wish he could have gotten a little bit more. Just that, like that, get yeah. that, that last hundred yards to yeah. get in there and finish this thing. Yeah. So watch that next, uh, okay. that next ending. Okay. It's, uh, it's like about, I don't know, less than five minutes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think. I don't know why they didn't uh, didn't choose that. Do you do you remember um, Misery with Kathy Bates? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Film? Um, uh, I think in the Stephen King novel, she chops his foot off because oh, really? I'd read the novel before that the a... film came out, and she uses a she uses a ham a big yeah. huge hammer hammer um, and breaks his foot in the film, and right. I guess that's less, pain, you know, like maybe that's less violent, but but it, the impact of it was amazing. Right. You know, it was sure. like if, if she chopped his leg off, I don't think it would have been it would have played more like dramatic yeah. as she coming in with this big, you know, right. hammer and, and slamming into him. So yeah, usually, usually they, they get that right. I yeah, think. yeah. There's, there's a reason that they do those jobs and have those editors and, and right. all that. But uh, and then that process. So first novel comes out, and was it a hit right away? It uh, it, it sold to Hollywood before it came out, so that makes it sound like oh, you're going to the moon. Um, but it, I didn't go to the moon. <laughs> it it had a lot of really good pre pre orders and it got a lot of good buzz, so it did well. Um, the second and third books did less well than the first one. And then Clancy came along and I, it, it really reinvigorated my gray man so series. Name as recognition as well. type yeah, thing. It, I think it, it definitely helped a lot. That's amazing. And uh, some of those, some of the gray man novels are fairly long. Uh, yeah. So the fourth, is it the fourth one? So right after dead eye is back. Uh, uh, back blast. Back is the blast. Fifth one. Yeah. That's pretty long. Yep. Yeah. Is that the longest or is the mission critical? I feel like uh, Gunmetal Gray is my longest. Yeah. Um, they're, they're all about 160 to 170 now. So they're pretty, uh, 100, 170,000 words. Okay. They're pretty long novels, um, which is nothing anyone told me to do. I think just working with Clancy and expanding stories right. is part of it. Another part of it is at the beginning, I just see this story playing out. And right. it's like, well, I want to know what this character, you know, what if this character and this character had all these little things yeah. that come in your head, you want to put it in you do have to end up filtering things out and yeah. you can't put everything in there. But, um, you know, I have the freedom to, to write more. I mean, it right. takes a lot longer to write these books. <laughs> I, I have friends that put out 90,000 word right. books and they're doing as well as I am, you know, yeah. nobody's doing any better. Um, and I'm basically writing double that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They don't read like it's long though. Like they don't read like they break when you read those things, you fly. Yeah. Through. I appreciate so doesn't read that. Like it's like, Oh, what's this long thing setting up yeah, for? And I'm like, I, you read, you're on that, you're on that train. Something's always got to be happening. You know, there's, I don't, I don't do just like, you know, long oh, periods yeah. of, of just. Right. Figuring, they, they yeah, start off right I away. Like I like on every page if I can do it. Yeah. No, they're, they're awesome. And then what, uh, how did the, so I got option before it came out. And so, and, uh, and my first one did too. And it's very exciting of yep. course. Um, so what's that journey been like for you with the, the Hollywood side of the house? Yeah. And, it's, uh, you know, I, I say I've gotten, Paid and the checks cleared, so that's the good, go. the good side of it. So, uh, uh, yeah, New Regency optioned it at first, and they had it for about four years, and they you know re upped the option you know, four or five years, and then it it came back out on the market, and then Sony um, got the option um, for three years, and in the course of that, at one point they changed the the lead character from a male to a female because. Uh, Charlie's Theron, yeah, and they rewrote a the whole manuscript, uh, a whole script for it, and everything. 
But as an author, you want people to read your books, and and there was no way we could put out, re, you know, re-release right. the Gray Man with her on the cover, and it's yeah. a totally different story on the inside. And it and I just saw that as a it, from a business perspective, it wasn't sexism or anything like that. Yeah. It was just from a business oh, perspective. Sure. It's like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to sell a million books when this movie comes right. out. Um, so, uh, but the, but that fortunately kind of died on the vine, so yeah. that's not in, in, in play anymore. Those different scripts have been written at different times. Um, Sony exercised their right to purchase the film out outright, so they did that um, oh, nice. years ago. So they they own it outright now, and um, I've heard different directors circling it, right. sort of stuff. And there's there's another script, and I I do think this is the fifth or sixth script yeah. that's been written um, in different studios. And because they they own it, do you get do you, do they, you get to look at it, or they just they just take it? Or if they did like let's say number eight in the series, would uh, then would you get to look at it, give any input, or are you negotiating now from a, a position of strength because you have all these novels and they can say, oh, look, if this one does well as a movie, look at all these other ones we can Yeah, do. hopefully that helps it a little bit. Although, you know, Hollywood is just very strange. Like, I've read some of the scripts that they've written, and I, and I think if I went to the theater and saw that, I would not know that it was a book I wrote. I'm not, yeah. It's not an exaggeration, especially the, the one with the female lead. Like, it right. takes place in Colombia, whereas mine takes place in Europe. And, yeah. Uh, I think it, they end up in Europe, they go to Turkey and stuff. Whole different plot. Um, right. There's no, really nothing similar to, to my book at all, and I don't understand why they would want to, you know, pay me money and take the name. <laughs> they could have just made and, this up. Exactly, they, they just done this on their own. So I don't really understand that aspect of the process. Yeah. I don't officially have any say in anything. Right. For uh, a couple of years, the the Russo brothers, Joe and Anthony Russo, were going to direct it for Sony, and they actually wrote the screenplay, and it was a terrific screenplay. Joe Russo wrote it. And um, he had me come out to California and I spent a few days with them. And we talked about the character and, you know, where, where it goes in the series and all that sort of stuff. So that was nothing in the contract, you know, but it was just they right. wanted my input. And, right. um, you know, I, I spoke with another screenwriter. I, I've just became really good friends with him. Another guy that wrote the uh, screenplay for The Gray Man. So uh, nothing in the contract that says that I have any, yeah. any power, but it's kind of up to the. Right. Does it seem like they want to get rid of the author almost? Well, so they're like, that's not how I envisioned this on the set. You're like, oh, this guy is yeah, driving me I, crazy. I, 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 it's been explained <laughs> to me before that, like, you know, the director on the set does not want another person there that feels like they own the story. Yes. And, and that makes perfect it's sense. Totally to me, understandable. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You kind of got to divorce yourself from that. It seems right. like, like, hey, oh, this is a, yeah. I, I trust you to do what you're going to do with it. And yeah. I've given you control to yeah, do those things. God, and, yeah. Good, what you got. Good luck. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Let's uh, sell some books. So yeah. Exactly. That's amazing. And then, um, do you do one research trip a year, multiple, or are they all, maybe you do one that's tied to, uh, to a book that's a couple down the line, or how does that work? It's usually for the book I'm working on. I mean, I think it's always been for the book I'm yeah. working on, and um, it could be a number of trips. This year, I did one trip where I went to um, Croatia mm -hmm. and Bosnia. I was following Croatia. along on social media. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it was <laughs> awesome. And, uh, and you got a I dive went, in out I there, I think? Italy. Yeah, I, I did some diving in Croatia. And then um, and then I came home, and then a few weeks later, I went out to L.A. for almost two weeks to, to do research out there for, for the same book. Nice. And um, it's, it's not always the case. I've, I've researched virtually every book except one book I had to cancel on my trip because I had to have surgery on my ankle. And, and uh, I had this big trip to Thailand and, and nice. Vietnam planned and, and had to cancel the whole thing. But it was funny because I still had to write the book about right. Taiwan. So I lost my... Or not Taiwan, um, Hong Kong and and, and yeah, Vietnam Thailand and all Vietnam, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I kind of lost my opportunity to go there on a on a on a research trip right. because the book, you know, I, I didn't have to circle back through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Eventually he'll <laughs> he'll be back over there because I really wanted to go. I want to go too, and I was slated to go there. My platoon was slated to go there before September 11th. So oh, we're wow. getting ready to go, yeah. and uh, we were in Guam, and uh, I think it was going to happen. You know. 2001 sometime in the fall but uh, of course September 11th yeah. happened and they we didn't found get something to go. else for you to do yes yeah. yeah we got very busy very quickly yeah, yeah. and I uh, never got to go so I want to go back there and do some research yeah well um, I'm, at some point. I'm really hoping to do a second red metal which is the military yeah. thriller that I had come out this year that I co-authored awesome. and it would take place over in Asia so that's that's my get the trip <laughs> that's in. my chance to get there out, it is. get back out there so hope to do that yeah no absolutely and uh what um when you're what do you come up with all your titles or how does that work? Do they come to you? Do you have it when you start? How does it just come as you're writing? I come up with most of my titles. There's a couple of ones they didn't like or, you know, they didn't think would like play well to a certain demographic or something yeah. like that. Um, so the second book is called uh, On Target, the second Gray Man book, and it was originally called Killer of Men. And they just decided that they didn't think that would right. sell as well. So they came up with On Target. Uh, they came up with 50 and I chose, chose that one. <laughs> on, on Target. Um, most of the others I've done, um, mission, 
uh, um, agent in place yeah. was uh, Tom Colgan, my editor. Yeah. He came up with that title. Um, but I think all the others are mine. I'm, I'm, I'm messing around with the title for my 10th Gray Man book. Right. I, I have one that I want it to be. Um, and I don't know if uh, I haven't run it by the editor yet right. or anything like that. So, um, Got it. yeah, I, I don't need to know the whole story to have a title. I mean, it, the, 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 the objective of the title yeah, is yeah. to, is to get you to look at the cover and what's inside. And right. All that. Yeah. yeah. I've been curious because the first one, the title, the terminal list was just blatantly obvious. Like, right. But like, as I wrote this one page synopsis, like yeah. that's what it's going to be. Same thing. True believer, totally obvious. Like what this title is going to be. Cause they both have dual meanings. Uh, third one, I had a different title and I loved it. And, uh, they, they did whatever they do, the, uh, floated around yeah, Simon Savage Schuster or whatever. Good, that, that was, that yeah, was, the, second, that that was, was the, second the second one. Okay. Yeah. But I came up with that too. Yeah. But the first one I'm going to hold cause I'm going to use it for something. Right. It's, uh, but it's too, it was, they're like, it seems too thoughtful. <laughs> too thoughtful. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll use that. it for something <laughs> yeah. else. Uh, and then I'm like, oh, how about Savage Sun? So that yeah. one, uh, that one came up, but I'm always fascinated with how you come up with those or if you get worried that you get close to the end and still don't have one that's really ringing true to you. Like you get that nervous. A, I, or, I, I like to to call my work in progress something. So I like yeah, to yeah. have a title. Like I think it makes it more real so. earlier right. on. And uh, most of the Clancy books I did, I came up with the title, but several, some I didn't locked on. Yeah. Uh, the first one I did was called locked on and it has an RPG seven on the cover. And, yeah, yeah. and I, you know, I emailed them. I'm like, does it bother anybody that in this whole book, nothing locks on anything else. <laughs> and the RPG seven isn't going to lock That's on. Awesome. Anything. And, and they're like, no, not really. And I was like, okay, but Perfect. this is how you learn as a yeah, new yeah. author. You're like, okay, that does not matter. It's totally. And, and to this, like this day, if, if somebody came up and said that to me, I'd be like, this guy didn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. But yeah, and I didn't know what I was talking <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't think badly of them because I didn't know either. But right. yeah, I, some of those titles I didn't come up with. Um, my favorite, Clancy title was Threat Vector, and mm -hmm. I came up with that. Nice. Uh, cyber and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's fun. I've, I've told my editor, it's like, as important as it is to write the 200,000 words inside, I get more of a thrill when they accept my two title. words on the outside nice. or three words. Nice. I like yeah. it. And then going forward, is it, it one a year, one gray man a year, and maybe one with uh, with Rip or... Um, At least for the next two years, it's going to be one gray man a year. Uh, Rip and I definitely want to do a second, you know, follow up to Red Metal. It did really well. Nice. Um, and, um, and we, you know, it was a great experience doing it. We, you know, I've said all along and he's agreed, we need a unique story. I said, you know, that Red Metal takes place in the snow. We can't do it where instead of snow falling, coconuts are falling because right, you're, right. you're in Asia. You know, it's, it's, there it has, has to be, be it has to be oh, yeah. completely different. And so Rip's, Rip's got a ton of good ideas. I've nice. got some ideas and, um, and I think it'll happen. Um, not exactly sure when I'm about to take a couple months off because I've spent about three years behind schedule with one yeah. book, not starting one book until the other wow. one, which, you know, is running late and all that. Incredible. So. Yeah. I was very cognizant of that too, for the second, for true believer. I, I knew I had, it had to be different. I knew I just couldn't yeah. pick it up and drop the same revenge story Absolutely. in Europe. Yeah. And so I was very cognizant that it had to be different. It had to jump around uh, a little bit more, have more of a geopolitical angle to it, right. have a little more character development to it. And uh, so I, I thought it was a little bit of a risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, to do to do that because the first one did do well yeah. um but i also didn't want people to think oh one trick pony is the same story just right. dropped it in africa you right, just dropped right. it in, in russia or whatever so yeah. well it's a, um, it's a tough balance isn't it to to find uh the same thing but different or right. to find something to reward the people that have stayed with your whole yeah. series as your series will get longer you'll see that you know it's like you want the people that have followed all along the way to have their expectations met and at the same time people that pick up your book for the first time on your fifth book, right. you want them to get totally fully involved in the story as well. So it's this balancing act. Sometimes I'll read books and I feel like they're given too much backstory yeah. you know, of other things. And then right. other times I'm reading books and I'm like, why do I care about this guy? You know? Right. Just so so I'm, I'm very cognizant of that. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm panicky about yeah. not, not hitting that, that note. Oh, right. Yeah. No, that's one of the things that one of the edits that does come in and came in on the second one, came in on this third one is that I need to give a little more, backstory like yeah. why does this why is this happening for people that haven't read the first one right. then you don't want to go overboard on right, it right, and right. just like do a copy paste you <laughs> no. know yeah, you like, do it you do it as as briefly as you can like in, in my books now it'll basically say gray man is a you know former cia assassin now he yeah. does contract work for the agency and you know it just kind of yeah. gets you want to find out by go buy the first nine it, it, exactly know? yeah <laughs> that's uh that's kind of what i'm i'm doing too i'm thinking about that like hey how do i make them how does uh, this next book flow yeah and but also make them be curious about what happened in the first one or the second one. Right. By the way, I'm describing exactly. uh, him and his yeah. story and where if he's If they like your going. writing, they're going to go check those books out yeah. as well. You know, so you don't have to like over like um, advertise your, your other books. Sometimes, Got it. sometimes I feel like there, there's a little of that in, in novels. Um, but you know, if I'm they go back up and edit right now, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, just personally, I think like if, 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 if 
if th- this book stands on its own, people are right. going to want to see other stuff that you, you've read from my experience. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And then, uh, where can people find you online or on uh, the social channels? Or how do you how do you engage with uh, with fans? Well, and all I'm, that sort of I'm all over the place. Uh, I'm spread thin. Uh, <laughs> MarkGrainyBooks.com is my website, and I am on Facebook. Uh, my author page on Facebook is Mark Grainy Books, and I'm on uh, Twitter. It's Mark Grainy Book Singular because I couldn't fit enough letters <laughs> in. <laughs> and That's I'm on funny. Instagram at Mark Grainy Books. So yeah, I'm out there in all those places. Nice. Where do you where do you find your most engagement? Did you start with Facebook and then add Twitter as it came along, or add? Because I'm so new to this, yeah, I was I was brand new two years ago. That's yeah, that's exactly it. I started with Facebook, and um, I like Twitter to just like read through stuff and look at stuff and maybe repost things. But I don't do a lot of like you know primary stuff on Twitter. I do a lot on Instagram these days, just yeah. because I find myself in a place where I want to share a picture, or something, right? Um, whether it's travel or dogs or here right. at UltraCon or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so, but I, but I do probably Facebook is where I, you know, that was your hear, base because you, you hear the most one. about my stories. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I came on so late that, uh, three platforms was so much. So sure. I just chose Instagram and, and Twitter, yeah. which is still too much. But, uh, I think Facebook just could repost from my Instagram. So there's right. no really yeah. engagement there for yeah. me. Um, but if you started early, like if I started this in 2005 or something like that, or six, whenever, whenever Facebook came yeah. out, um, then I probably would have built up that base and I'd yeah. be more familiar with using it. But right now I can't even, I don't even know how to log in or respond to something on, on Facebook. Yeah. It, it, Instagram is, is probably more comfortable than Facebook just because you don't have, um, you know, it, it's, everything's based on a picture. So it's not, you know, your political thought of the day that's yeah. going to get you know pushed back on or whatever. Right, so right, it's huh? probably a safer place to go be. down these rabbit holes. Yeah. yeah I don't want to do that. I, no I've done a little of it. You probably for that. Do it. <laughs> There's for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. I'm very fu- I'm fond of the block. Uh, yeah, you know, anything that's appropriate block. I don't have time for this. You know, exactly. I have so much to do. I can't uh, go down these little rabbit sure. holes. So I try not to uh, post anything that'll lead me down those yeah. types of rabbit holes. Right. But I'm sure, I'm sure it'll happen. At uh, yeah, I get sucked in every now and then. And then, <laughs> like two hours later, I'm like, I don't care anymore. What, I really cared two hours ago. Ah, <laughs> yeah. oh, geez, it's already passed. Something news in the news. Yeah, exactly. You know? Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing hey, this today. I enjoyed this. It yeah, means this a lot to me. I no, learned a ton okay. and I know everybody <laughs> else did as well. And uh, congratulations on everything. It's an uh, amazing uh, journey that you've been on and it's a, an inspiration for for me and uh, and also to see how you've handled everything, how you've handled that success and how you continue to help out people that are new to this industry. Um, it's, a, it's a great example for everybody. So oh, appreciate thank you for the much. leadership yeah, and uh, sure. yeah, let's, uh, let's go get a couple of drinks. Terrific. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Man. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. You can find more about Mark Graney on his website at markgraney, G-R-E-A-N-E-Y, books.com. Link to his social channels from there. Be sure to pick up his latest book, Relentless, and pre-order his newest, which is coming out on February 15th called Sierra Six. If you liked our conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. And until the next time, Take care, stay safe, keep fighting.